Good morning. Thanks for joining us for today's HIS Talk webinar, Earning Medicare's New Chronic Care Management Payments, Five Easy Steps to Take Now. It's brought to you by West Healthcare Practice. I'm Lori from HIS Talk and I'll be moderating. I have a few housekeeping items to make you aware of before we get started. Attendee phone lines have been muted to prevent background noise. You can use GoToWebinar's questions box in the console to submit questions to our presenters at any time. The presenters will answer your questions during Q&A at the end. Today's webinar is being recorded, so you'll receive links to the recording and a PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation in a follow-up email. Our first speaker today will be Bob Dudzinski. Bob is Executive Vice President within the Healthcare Practice at West Corporation. Bob received his doctorate in pharmacy from the University of Nebraska Medical Center and has extensive experience in pharmacy benefit management, home care, management information systems, and related industry topics spanning over 20 years. Joining Bob will be Colin Roberts. Colin is Senior Director of Product Integration at West Corporation, where he brings over a decade of experience in health analytics, patient engagement, and payment integrity. Colin is responsible for product development for a number of West's engagement center solutions, including those that support chronic care, transition care, and routine care management. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Bob. Great. Thanks, Lori. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're very happy to be here today and really are looking forward to helping the audience uh, better understand or add to their acumen around Medicare's new chronic uh, care management uh, reimbursement. And perhaps, maybe just as important, uh, offer some suggestions on how maybe to solve some of the challenges that uh, organizations have been experiencing in delivering on it. And I know today that we have uh, a wide variety of sentiment about the program. Clearly we have some positions that have been very successful, and yet some have struggled to really kind of determine the value uh, uh, of the program in and of itself. And I know that we have varying sentiment uh, in between. But I think what we all believe here is that, uh, that there will be elements of this program that will play an important role in the future as the industry, as we all kind of trudge on, skip to, run to uh, a value-based system. And I do believe that engaging early on uh, to be critical in determining what processes you'll need, systems, innovations are all necessary to be successful, again, as we as we move to this value-based uh, reimbursement environment. But uh, before we begin to jump into that, uh, I'd like to quickly review some of the nuts and bolts uh, of the program in and of itself. Uh, we will also look on how to calculate potential revenue impact to your practice or maybe to your physician group. Uh, then we'll really get into what we believe are the five key areas of focus as it relates to processes, the clinical resources, the available technologies needed for really delivering an effective care, chronic care management program. And then we'd like to close up uh, with some of the various options in the market today that uh, physicians, providers have when it comes to standing up these resources uh, and these technologies. So let's just jump in. Um, again, just to recap, to set everybody at the same level, uh, Medicare CCM code 99490 took effect January this year as we all know. The program pays doctors an average of about $40 per patient per month per qualifying beneficiary. Um, the program in itself carries a pretty sizable payload for primary care uh, as we'll see in a moment. But now physicians can be paid for the hours of non-face-to-face -face time they spend on behalf of their beneficiaries with two or more chronic conditions. And uh, for some of you, this care uh, has been provided for free for a very long time. But for many more doctors, this offers now an opportunity to implement a new value-based care program and get paid for it if we document at least 20 minutes per month reviewing a patient's issues and answering uh, some of the questions that they may have. Now, there are some basic processes and systems that doctors need to have in place really in order to capture the new reimbursement. Certainly, the use of an electronic health record, patient education, and obtaining consent, but there are also, for many providers, a few high bars, challenges, around the ability to administer a comprehensive plan of care. And that also involves providing 24 by seven uh, patient access to care plan management 
as well as having some of the technologies in place to enable patient to provider communications really beyond your four walls of your setting or from the hospital in and of itself. So for many providers, these two requirements alone really have posed some insurmountable challenges. Um, but however, the market around chronic care management is evolving and it's responding to these challenges, really a number of solutions to help providers successfully augment their operations to deliver on the necessary scale and capacity, the right technologies, really in a cost-effective way, and really to deliver on the promise of chronic care management. You know, and this does really represent a very significant financial opportunity. Uh, per the slide, let's take a look at the reimbursement opportunity in the context of a physician group of about 50 doctors. For one of those docs, the assumption here is that there are roughly 750 beneficiaries and about two-thirds of them qualifying for chronic care management by having uh, two or more chronic conditions. Now, not all the patients will choose to participate in the CCM program, but a conservative approach here would say just about over half will. At an average per patient per month reimbursement of about $42, $43, that represents uh, a little over uh, $135,000 for that doc. Now, of course, if you want to multiply that across the 50 physician practice, the revenue potential for the group collectively now is in the neighborhood of about $6.7 million. And again, I think it's also important to look beyond some of the dollars and cents uh, when you begin to evaluate uh, whether or not to get into the CCM game. And so what we've added is some other considerations uh, that you may may want to think about. As an example, strategic alignment. Should we establish this function as part of our evolution to a value-based care? You may eventually be asked to do beyond this. This may simply be training wheels uh, for you to move, move into a value-based system. What about gaps in readiness? How prepared are we from a staffing, clinical, operational, and technical perspective? And then do we read, should we, can we, evaluate partnerships. Do we really need to build out all the infrastructure ourselves? Are there other ways to effectively accomplish uh, CCM collectively? So with that, I'm going to turn the next series of slide presentations over to Colin and he will get into really some of the more details around CCM and how we position it uh, in the marketplace. Great. Thanks, Bob. And um, thanks, everyone on the phone for, for joining and, and for his talk for, for hosting us. Um, as, as Bob had said, uh, I'm going to review the five key areas that, that we see as being critical to uh, a, a successful or hosting and owning a successful chronic care management or CCM program. Um, those are listed here on the slide and, and really are in kind of chronological order with the exception of training and support, and I'll get to that at the end. But those five areas are identification and recruitment of patients, the enrollment and education of those same patients, um, the ability to engage and activate throughout the, the term of the CCM program, um, and then the ability to get reimbursed. Uh, the last one we've got on there is training and support, but really that's primarily going to be a foundation that's underneath this to ensure that all parties involved are aware of their role with which they're supposed to support as it relates to participating in a CCM program. So as I move into the first one, identification and recruitment is, is, is obviously the first step that you're going to want to step into. Um, if you're not able to segment or identify those patients um, who are dual chronic um, and who would qualify for this, you're really not going to have anybody to bill against. Um, but as you look at this, there's also other factors that, that are in play here, um, potentially taking into consideration socio and demographic um, analytics and considerations to ensure that the patients that you're targeting are those that would maybe adopt being participants in a program like this, are high adopters of maybe technology if you're going to use technology to help support and augment some of the functions as it relates to maybe biometric journaling and things to that effect. Um, and then also segmenting potentially those patients that you don't want to try and recruit. There is going to be a subset of patients that are either maybe too ill or too sick to really be able to monitor outside of the, the clinical setting. And you don't want to put a bunch of efforts towards those patients um, to try and get them potentially even confused around this program since they wouldn't benefit from it in the long run. 
Um, next step would be once you've got them identified is, is how do you make sure that they're aware and reach out to those patients. Um, you know, you've, you can obviously do this through the portal at point of, or at point of service when the patients are actually in the physical setting, but how do you get them to come in? And some of the options may be uh, leveraging postcards or even automated outbound channels through uh, voice and text and potentially even email. All of this will help you to drive to converting them into a patient at minimum that's interested in learning more about this. So that takes us to the next stage, which is enrollment and education. You know, uh, according to the rules, you do have to have an E to M or a wellness visit in place with these, visit with these patients in order to capture written consent. Um, and so as you get them in, you want to do what you can to make sure that the patient is aware and comfortable with why they're coming in for this, this visit. Um, so engagement and, and, and or I'm sorry, education is very, very critical as it relates to this. Because there is a co-payment involved, the patient needs to feel that they're getting something out of this, some value. And so uh, making sure that you schedule some appointment reminders to ensure that they do come into the appointment. But maybe once they've agreed to that, reinforcing it with additional outreaches, whether it be additional literature that you can send to them, or maybe you can even email or text them a URL to a link for a video that maybe actually updates them as to more of the benefits around what this program is going to entail for them. Once you've got them in for the face-to-face -face visit and you've actually um, educated and brought them up to speed and they've agreed to enroll, it is, it is required that you get their written consent as a physician to do this. It's also important to note that only one physician can manage one patient and bill for this code. Um, so it's going to be imperative that you're, if you're an integrated system that you've got some clearinghouse measures to be ensured that two docs aren't trying to bill for the same patient. Um, but once you do have it, that written consent does have to be recorded electronically in the EMR. And then you also have to be able to establish some set care plan goals that this patient can adhere to uh, throughout the course of this care, chronic care management program. Um, these can be things like uh, traditional care management type things, lose weight, make sure you're taking your readings on a regular basis, reduce the salt in your diet, things to that effect. That's a key point though because those care plan goals are items that you can leverage as touch points as you start getting into the engagement and activation phase of um, making sure that the patients are adhering to these and providing that non-face-to-face -face time. And then you also have to be able to provide that care plan to both the patient and their care coordination team, whether it be a family care coordinator or maybe it's their specialists in their network. So now you've got them enrolled. Now what? Well, this is where it really the, the kind of the meat of the program. This is where you establish a partnership with that patient to ensure that they are engaged throughout this entire program. Now, not all of this time needs to be spent talking and in dialogue with the patient. Some of these items can be done um, on your own time, not necessarily engaging the patient. But again, in order to ensure that the patient receives value, I would, I would recommend that there would be some form of a monthly touch point with the patient, at least so that they are aware that they're continually being monitored within the CCM program. Some of the activities that you would want to look at is their progress towards those goals. Um, what are the goals that they, that they had established um, and, and how are they progressing towards those ends? Do they have any upcoming appointments? And if so, how are you going to manage those appointments to make sure that they're going to adhere to those appointments? whether it be a diabetic getting in to see the eye doctor or their A1C or things to that effect. Medications are critical. Medication adherence, assur uh, assuring that the patients have all of the right medications, they have access to them, they're picking them up and they're taking them. The bottom three are, are, are interesting ones as well. Personal assistance. There are some of those patients out there that have the intent to get to these appointments but maybe not the ability. So is there a means to be able to schedule car service for them to get there? Or maybe they don't have the means to be able to pick up their medications. So personal assistance and helping them in, in those manners. Continuous education and support. Again, this is again a foundational component, making sure that the patient understands the purpose, the reasons, and supporting them throughout any challenges that they may have. And then exception-based intervention. The nice thing about this is if you are successful in setting up a CCM program, it affords you the ability to establish a value-based system, as Bob had referenced, 
but it also allows you as you're interacting with these patients to potentially identify those critical situations that had this not been in place, they would have ended up in the ER. So you can identify those, sex, those exceptions and recruit them in for a face-to-face -face visit and intervene before they become critical. Some points to consider on the right-hand side there is there is a need to provide 24 by 7 care access, but there's also uh, this multimedia patient engagement component uh, to allow you to scale this up in a manner that is effective. So again, back to the appointments or uh, lab reminders to ensure that you can do that through some automation technology. Biometric telemonitoring, whether you've got remote sensors or maybe you establish an IVR to capture readings so the patient can call those in and not actually have to talk to a care coordinator. Um, Self-care videos we've talked about and wellness surveys. Call routing so that way when the call phone, phone call comes in, you can actually route them to the, the care coordinator that they've been working with. But I think the most important here is to ensure that when you're communicating with these patients, you're communicating with them in the channel that they choose. So if I choose to, ch to communicate and receive my reminders about my blood pressure readings in text, send me that text message. But if, I, if I'm more interested in learning more information, you want to send that to me in email, making sure that I'm engaged throughout the channel that I want to be engaged through. Then the big one, get reimbursed. Um, it's important that you document the time that you spend, whether it's uh, on phone time talking with the patient or reviewing their summaries, reviewing their readings, um, things to that effect. It's important that you keep this, uh, keep track of the time spent on this because while it's not a, a component of the ruling today, uh, if Medicare decides to audit, you'll have to have that trail to ensure that you did everything that you needed to to capitalize on that 20 minutes of non-face-to-face -face time. You would bill the eligible payments. And then the other option is, uh, item here is also the component that the patient's going to have some responsibility. There is a 20% coinsurance, so at a $40 amount, that's eight bucks per patient per month. Um, you've got to ensure that you drive value back to the patient so they understand why that, that money is required of them, but you should also enable them the ability to make sure that they make that payment. Now, sometimes it could be just rolled up into your traditional um, means for billing patients, but there's other options out there where you can put in uh, potentially notifications, patient balance notifications, reminding them that they've got an outstanding balance. Maybe that transfers into an IVR where they can actually make the payment through an IVR, or you could transfer into your billing department to ensure that they get the payment made. But there's, this is all about setting you up for success to ensure that you continually are getting the reimbursements you need and also making sure that the patients are engaged throughout. And uh, finally, the fifth step is training and support. Again, this is more foundational and it's probably throughout, but it's ensuring that uh, all of the training requirements and all of the requirements from a CCM standpoint are identified and adhered to, um, but also ensuring that roles and responsibilities are clearly defined. So if the doctor needs to see the patient, he or she knows exactly what they're supposed to do when they see that patient. If you've got a care coordination team, they know exactly what it is that they're supposed to be doing when they're helping manage these patients or coordinate their care. And even more so, the patient, understanding the value of the program, why they're supposed to be doing this, the benefits that they may receive because of this. And then finally, billing and consent management to ensure that you're getting the right people on um, in, at, at the right time. All of this should be done in an interactive way, role-based, um, accurate and relevant, and then also make sure that you track to completion. So if you've got an education series out there, make sure that you track that it has been completed if it's a web-based uh, model or a video link that has been uh, required to be wa uh, watched. So my last slide before I turn this back over to Bob is really what are the options and what are the approaches that you have as it relates to setting up and establishing this type of a program? Um, you know, it's the, the ever, ever growing build versus buy. Uh, we've actually layered in partner. You know, you do have the option to build this on your own, uh, but in doing so, you've got to make sure that you maintain and train the staff uh, for 24 by 7 clinical uh, purposes. Um, you make sure that you've got the, imp the appropriate uh, telecommunications technologies implemented to ensure that you can communicate with these patients um, bi-directional as well as in the channel of their choice. And then also have an ability to target and recruit the patients outside of the clinical setting. If you're going to be wholly reliant on these patients to come in face-to-face -face and educate them on that time, 
the ramp up on this is going to be significant uh, if you, unless you put in a targeted approach to recruit those patients in, the, the scale on this from a revenue ramp standpoint is probably not there. The other option, though, is to partner, and you've got two really options here. One time you could partner with someone to help you create a plan and a new program, which could be a completely outsourced turnkey solution, um, or you could also take that turnkey solution and start learning from it and then adopting it within your own practice as it grows and matures. Um, one other option is within an enterprise system um, or a multi-doc system. This is something that you could leverage to help recruit either additional doctors or additional patients through doctors as a value-added service that you can provide to those doctors once you've got a mature program in place. So there's a selling point back into the practices. The other option is to potentially identify those partners that you maybe already have in existence and improve upon what they're bringing to the table in comparison to what they're currently bringing to the table, or could bring to the table, I should say. Things like uh, patient targeting and recruitment. Again, outbound notifications could be critical here. Um, clinical overflow and after hour support. Maybe you've got some call center reps that could be appended to this and just help with the 24 by 7. Um, again, communication technologies uh, and remote patient monitoring technologies are, are another big asset that can be leveraged in this space. And then finally, again, the training, making sure that you've got an adequate training uh, to help train the doctors as well as the care coordination team as well as the patients to ensure that everybody understands their roles and responsibilities. So that is everything that I have. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Bob. Thanks, Colin. Um, I'm going to close here with just a little bit about our organization, and I promise to make our infomercial short. Um, West Corporation, we're publicly traded. We're really a technology-driven communication company. We're here in Omaha, Nebraska, the heartland of America. We're about 10,000 employees. And we, uh, as a, a communication uh, uh, technology-focused company, we participate in about every industry. So we have footprints in banking, finance, transportation, public safety, and certainly healthcare. We do a lot of healthcare. Um, uh, as an example, nine out of the top 10 health plans, 14 out of the top 15 health systems, and certainly a lot of pharmacies, pharma, and employers are using uh, West uh, communication technologies or our clinical uh, certified clinicians. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Lori. Okay, thanks, Colin. Um, as a reminder to the attendees, you can use the questions box in the console to ask questions of Colin and Bob. Um, I have several questions already. Meg wants to know, from an auditing standpoint, must the time be documented in the record or can it be calculated on the back end from some start-stop times in an electronic system? Or if you've established standard times for each activity, can this be used to demonstrate the 20 minutes rather than specific documentation in the record? Uh, quite a question, uh, very good question, but uh, clearly the, the, there will be absolutely a need to document the time associated with the uh, uh, engagement. Some people are using their own systems, their EHRs, their EMRs, their applications that do have built-in timers. However, other organizations are simply manually recording it, literally, stopwatch uh, and to the end. I would not suggest uh, allocating a given task to a defined number of minutes because I think that's very difficult to validate. Uh, so again, I would look towards the first two options as satisfying the requirements for CCM. And I think this is Colin, one of the, one of the things that's most critical outside of all of this is to ensure that you can tie the time spent to a patient record. As long as you can tie, attribute the amount of time that you've spent to a specific patient record and designate what was, what was done, that's, that's the, probably another critical point as well. Okay, thanks. Um, Beth would like to know, our practice has started providing CCM to our patients. The copay is the biggest hurdle we face from both patients and providers. The providers understand the benefit to the patients, but the pushback from patients is significant. Do you have suggestions for language to use or communication strategies to overcome this barrier? The answer to that is yes, and that is a common 
challenge because again, as you can all imagine, uh, the common question is, well, I thought you were doing this before. And so I think what becomes critically important is to properly educate the patient on the value of the program uh, and what they intend to receive from this program and differentiate what they what you have historically done and how how the system has ultimately been uh, uh, approved or improved I should say and yes to this audience we can provide some uh, additional uh, uh, verbiage around uh, uh, how to how to overcome that particular hurdle all right thank you um, will would like to know a lot of this seems to be manual tasks. Are you seeing any technology vendors that are designing around the coordinated delivery of this service? The answer is is yes. And there is continued focus on delivering technology to bring scale uh, and capacity. As an example, we touched on a couple of these uh, in the slide. They maybe weren't very conspicuous per se, but as an example, in the recruitment process, you know, the ability to hand a data file to a vendor who can do an automated outreach to do an appointment reminder or maybe even educate, do some pre-educational work to your, uh, to your patient population uh, at scale. So in other words, the trick here is, is to get them engaged and bring them and enroll them into the program. Add to that then the ability to use uh, additional technologies to facilitate some of the work around uh, the, the engage and activate portion of our of our slide. Colin mentioned using, uh, as an example, uh, outbound active voice response technology to capture a blood pressure reading, do some decisioning on it, and then really if that, if that blood pressure reading is high, use uh, communication technology to connect that patient back to the doctor's uh, office. The consumption of remote monitoring uh, is certainly proliferating uh, in the marketplace. So what we're seeing today is leveraging communication technologies in all facets of those key areas from enrollment to education to participating in the acquisition of, of biometrics and even some back-end uh, touch points like automated outbounds that said, uh, you know, have you gotten your refills uh, filled on a Friday? Uh, oh, by the way, before you go to the ER, come talk to me first. So all of that we're seeing in the marketplace today. One other, one other point to that is, <clears throat> excuse me, most of these tasks have to be manual. Uh, it's required that you cannot capitalize or facilitate the non-face-to-face -face time using technology. However, as Bob just spoke to, you can leverage the technology to better enable your care coordination staff so that their time spent on the phone isn't talking about Grandma Mary's kitty cat, it's talking about Grandma Mary's hair, her health not her hair, her health. Um, so the whole point would be to better facilitate the conversation and dialogue between the care coordinator and the patient. Um, another example of that might be a well-being survey that you could do through either a web link in a text message or through a voice channel on, our, uh, on an interactive voice response system to kind of assess where the patient is from a feeling standpoint. So that way when I do call and talk to the patient, um, that patient, I know more about what's going on with that patient and we can actually get down to the meat of it rather than talking again about Grandma Mary's hair or her kitty cat. <laughs> okay, um, Christy would like some clarification. From what she understands, the only person who can bill is the primary care physician. So is it correct that if someone who works in the clinic with a licensure like a social worker or a nurse if they call the patient to provide some care management, it's not billable time. Is that right? Well, remember that CMS lists those eligible providers that can bill for uh, CCM. So there are there is the ability then to assist in that care coordination program, but you're not going to be billing under that under that individual's. Uh, uh, license or or activity per se, so it's still relegated to those identified uh, 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 providers that are eligible to bill. But again, the 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 support of that billing can be done by uh, individuals inside of your organization who are licensed to deliver on those types of services. So that's how I would frame up the two. 
it's under the uh, incident to definition. So as long as I'm billing the time that I am as a medical assistant or a CNA, that's incident to the relationship that that patient has with the billing physician, then it can be billed. Okay, Nick would like to know <clears throat> how an emerging digital health company can integrate with West to help deliver value to shared customers seeking CCM solutions. He wants to know if there are APIs available for bi-directional integration that can be leveraged. Short answer to that is, is yes. So uh, he can certainly reach out to our organization, and absolutely we have uh, APIs that can integrate. Okay, um, and Dr. Walker would like to know, um, he says most practices want to do this, but they don't want to spend a lot of money on it or train the staff. Are there vendors at no cost to practice, or what vendors are you working with that you recommend? Sure, and that's a, that's a, that's a great question, because here's the challenge. Do physicians really want to create the infrastructure out of the box, or is there alternatives to that to allow them to segue into, you know, value-based reimbursement? Because really, this is the this is the preface to that. So the answer to that is yes. There are organizations out there that can provide a turnkey uh, solution with minimal impact to a physician's uh, practice. What really then is required is a sharing of that reimbursement. So those are the models that we're seeing out there. So as an example, specifically, uh, if it's, uh, I'm, I'm using a rough number here, but if it's $40 uh, per, per patient per month, there's an opportunity for a physician to relinquish some of that reimbursement, not have the burden of setting up that infrastructure, uh, but still participating in CCM. And it also gets back to Colin's point, which is this is a way to test and try also as well, or maybe learn from best practices as you engage a vendor in that arrangement, you ultimately then could create your own system uh, and transition away from uh, a turnkey system per se, if that's the direction that seems most applicable and profitable uh, for the physician practice. Okay, great. Well, that was our last question. So with that, we'll conclude the webinar. I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and thank you, Bob and Colin, for an interesting and informative presentation. Attendees, watch your email for links to the recording of today's webinar, as well as the PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation. We look forward to seeing you at our next HIS Talk webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day.